think we can call Antonio to take this group picture and Dr. Ibrahim Kebba with us. We have on one stage such professional expertise and I would say it's the thought leaders of digital transformation and strategy implementation. We managed to gather all those thoughts and experts in one, pa in one stage. I think we did very great. Thank you. <laughs> now there is uh, just a short break because we are going out of time. So, and then we'll re reconvene for another very interesting session. Sandy Abra, my partner and CEO of Advisors on Portfolio and Benefit Management for Vision Realization. Afterwards, we will have Antonio Nieto Rodriguez on the project of the strategy implementation for QNAs. And at 2.30, we will adjust a bit the, uh, the, uh, the schedule not to be too late. At 2.30, those who will have a master class will go to the master class, and then the remaining will be we will uh, see Dr. Ibrahim Kepe on the enterprise data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you and welcome again. I'll start directly. So it's about portfolio benefit management for vision realization. The topic is really huge. I'm, I'm trying to capture at least three points. Something about sponsorship, something about building a vision realization office within a properly governed structure, managing more than one structure at the same time, and a little bit about portfolio, a little bit about managing benefits. And I like always to start with this quote. Uh, if we, this is all about knowledge management, so that we don't start from scratch every time. We learn from the mistakes of others. We stand on their shoulders, and hence we can reach higher grounds. And uh, the first thing I'm going to start with is a story. It's an epic story called It Takes Two to Time. So what's about this story? Uh, we have cast with us. Jad is the director, consider him the sponsor. And then we have this Sam. Sam is the project manager, okay, the four project managers. And then we have Farid. Okay, Farid is the project director, confident of himself. He is actually more experienced than Sam. Sam is more technical. And Jad with the cigar is the boss. These are the three actors with us today. And Jan assigns Sam as project manager for a very vital and important project. And Sam comes with confidence and he's happy and he wants to start his work immediately. Uh, and uh, of course, whenever we start a project, uh, we usually sign a document, some call it a chapter or internal contract or assignment. And Jan's uh, contract or charter is a cuff handling charter. You don't have an authority, you don't have delegation, you don't have uh, resources, but you are responsible and accountable for the success of the project. And Sam being the technical guy, not that much experience, don't say how to say no, and if I say no to my boss, maybe he will fire me. So he accepts and he knows that things will be hard. And what is the inevitable thing that happens? The project is delayed. And when the project is delayed, usually it exceeds the budget. And uh, at that stage, exceeding the budget, you start to, to cut corners on the scope or quality, then the client is not happy. And if the client is not happy, he does not pay the amounts in, in, in due course, and if he does not pay the amount, your management is not happy. So it's a full collapse, and what happens after that? Whom do, do we blame? Sam, kick him out. Because he was the one behind the failure of the project. We sponsors, directors, we never make mistakes. We are always right, as they say, or are we? So what happens in this case? We look for the second victim. Okay, let's look for another project manager because Sam was bad, 
was not able to manage the project. And we look now to hire Farid. Now Farid is experienced. And Farid starts to think, why did the guy before me leave or was fired? And he starts to investigate and assess. And of course, Jack offers the same uh, cuff handling uh, uh, charter, but Farid refuses to sign on the charter. And he wants to negotiate, not his salary, not his pay, not his benefits, but rather something important for the project to succeed. And he has conditions. Now, Jacques, being the director, is not happy or accustomed to, to take conditions from his subordinate. This does not happen. But the problem is that that was a very critical project. And Jacques is embarrassed. He wants the project to go on. So he decides to listen to Farid. And what does Farid ask for? Farid has three conditions. Number one, he wants full executive support. And he wants Jad's role to be defined. Matthew will help us in defining the competencies and skills for Jad to actually support the project. A lot of research by PMI and others stated that sometimes up to 80% of the causes of success or failure comes from executive support or lack of executive support. Because the four project manager in Pendle, they say there is procurement. Have you ever seen a project manager who can procure on his own, especially on capital projects? Never happens. There is HR. Is there a project manager in the world who has the authority or right to assign resources to his project on his own? No. He asks for 20 qualified engineers and they give him five fresh grads. This is always the case. They don't give you whatever you ask for. So without executive support, no project will succeed. This is number one condition. Number two, governance. We should agree on the specific delegation of authority sanctioned to Farid. I cannot manage the project if my hands were, were, were tight. I need some access to resources. I need to be able to, to do some decisions, not full decisions. Nobody gives the ultimate full authority. But there is a level of delegation and authority that allows me to manage the project and its, its budget in a manner that will get the project to succeed. And number three, upskilling. Ah, again, Matthew. Upskilling for everybody. Capacity building for everybody, including the top manager. Because what we've seen a lot in many places, middle managers, professional people, they receive a lot of training. But our bosses do not. And I really have a very funny story, real story that occurred with me several years back. When I started my career, maybe in the very early stages of introducing PMP to the, to the MENA region, we had a telecommunication company. And this company, they asked us to train like 200 of the technical staff. And we started to train them. And on the first day, they were happy. On the second day, ah, we did not do this. This is why we failed. On the third day, ah, how can we do this? Our current regulations and processes prohibit us from doing the best practice. And day number four, they have had their methods. Okay, they are depressed. They know what needs to be done, but they cannot do it. And day number five, something funny happened. Towards the end of the course, they were uh, uh, bringing money from each other, like an agent say, Yam Aya. Okay, they're getting money, filling it in, in an envelope. And I was looking curious, but I didn't ask. At the end of the course, they gave me uh, uh, this envelope, which has money. And I said, what, what is this for? We have a contract, and we got, get paid from the organization. They said, no, this is from us, because we want to register our boss to attend the same course with you outside. If he does not know what we know, nothing will, will, will go on. And believe me, this is the real story. <laughs> so, Jad agrees to Farid terms, not happily, but he agrees. And when they make 
this agreement, what do you think happens to the project? It will succeed. And the project succeeds. And now Chad learned what he needs to do as a sponsor. Sponsorship and collaboration, they make success together. You cannot put the technical people or the project managers alone in the front end without either delegation or support or even both. Other than that, projects will fail and fail and fail. So, good collaboration will start to working together, not fighting, not killing each other. It's all about collaboration. This is what this guy of Ani Barba did. He, he has many funny videos. I don't know internet, I don't know e-commerce, I don't know supply chain, I don't know, I don't know. So how in the world did you put one of the largest enterprises that competes with Amazon? He said, I know how to get good people. But good people, qualified people, when you bring them, they fight. My role is to get them to collaborate, not fight. And when I succeed in this, the sky is the limit. Yes. Again, Steve Jobs, great ideas and great inventions do not happen by one man. So our objective is to move from the formula of Superman, one guy does it all, to the organizations should become, should become the superman. The institutionalization. If I go away, if there is a good process, if there is good governance, good knowledge management, a good system, good upskilling, somebody else will replace me and the boat will still go and reach its objectives. Rather than having only heroes, we want the organization to become the hero. And this is very vital for these things and for governments, okay? It's not about the person, it's about the whole government that should sustain and prevail. So, now Jad is happy, why? Sponsors and directors and leaders, they make or break projects. They make or break, make or break programs, portfolios, sustainable benefits, operational excellence, strategies, and vision. This is where we have to focus on. This is where we have to start on. Now, the second part, to speak quickly about vision realization office. Of course, whenever we have a vision, many countries or organizations, they have a long-term vision, then this vision is cascaded down, sometimes to chunks of five years, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm talking here about a country called Pakistan, okay? So they can cascade this 2015 to 2025, 2030, 2035, and for each one they want to identify the objectives and link them to issues of importance like international trade, finance, investment, tourism, technology, and try to develop all these sectors. And in this happy stand, they look up on uh, human capital, social services, economic transformation, infrastructure, and governance and resilience as their pillars. And for every pillar, for them to realize it, what do they do? They assign if an up to five years program, and this is called a vision realization program. So if we set the objectives for vision 2025 as ABC, Across each one of our pillars, we will have programs that should finish by that day and provide not, not uh, outputs, not just uh, deliverables. We need outcomes and we need impacts that are measurable. We need to see the change going on. And of course, whenever we have programs, then we introduce program management, which is believe me, very, very different than project management. And very few know the difference between both. Of course, each one of these programs will be attached as a transformational program that transforms part of the organizations. And it will have its details and its KPIs. Then, right now, we have just have got our vision 2025 across the four pillars that are important to us. And we start to identify the VIPs. 
But how do we manage all this? How do we manage it country-wise? Okay, on a huge scale that includes multiple ministries, multiple organizations, public, private, NGOs, all together. We need some components, some core components. So let's assume Happy Stan decided to establish a vision realization office. And this vision realization office, its objective is to realize the uh, 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 vision 2025, which is part of the larger vision. There are some centralized functions, like for strategy implementation. What are the best practices? How do we achieve that? How do we operate with the both operations and projects? What is the portfolio management structure for our investments? What's the organizational and digital transformation functions? The capital funding and budgeting, media communication, and of course, the center of excellence to preserve all the processes and the learning. Because we said, and we, I agree totally, fail and fail and fail until you succeed. You have, if you don't have an entity that preserves the knowledge and propagates the knowledge and make it usable knowledge, you're just gonna fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and fail. You're not gonna go to the succeed. So this should be centralized for the whole government. Then, of course, we need to have an office of national coordination between various ministries and various uh, entities. We should also introduce an entity that will help involve the private sector, the investors, to uh, have more DOT, more public-private partnerships. The government should not pay for all the improvement from their own pocket. They should include the private sector with them. And for that, you have to have an entity. Every good idea, if you don't have an owner for it with proper governance and objectives in an office, it will not happen. It will just be an idea that we talk about and talk about. Yes, this is nice. Yes, this works. Yes, this is what we need to do. But if you don't assign an office with staff, with objectives, it will never happen. Ownership is important. Then what about our programs? These are the centralized functions. Then our programs, each program will have its own structure and they have different structures. It will have the governance and the pervading life cycle, how to manage the benefits and the impact, the design and development, the procurement contracting, resource allocation and technical support. And why each one is independent? Because economic projects are different from infrastructure projects are different from social projects. So the type of processes that work in one industry or environment are not necessarily the same that would work in the other. So each program will have its own uh, program office. So now we have a centralized office with each program has its, its own office and we have a structure with proper governance and corporate communication. Corporate, I mean, communication between these offices in a in a uh, good manner. And here, the top important things I would like to focus on are the strategy implementation and portfolio management from one side at the centralized office or hub, and on the other side, the governance, integrated life cycle, value, benefit, and result based performance, but in a very, very brief manner. And for this, I have two. Uh, uh, or three other tasks I'm bringing with me today. Because the doctor comes out of the operating room and she tells Hamza, I have good news, the operation succeeded. Bad, bad news, the patient died. Okay? And when does this happen? In many cases, the project succeeds. But if the project is not in alignment with the strategy, would the organization benefit? No. If it is not the right project, or if this is the right project and it succeeded, but nobody was assigned to realize the benefit afterwards, operation were not, we did not transform them to become up in level in their maturity to realize the benefits of what the project will, will provide, nothing will happen. In both cases, the patient will die. What is our objective? Ah, I have good news, operation succeeded. I have great news the patient is recovering. So how do we move from one status to the other status? Okay? 
And here we are, we are we back. We love pyramids in Jordan. Uh, our logo was a pyramid before we opened in, in, in Egypt. So it's inevitable that we are here with you today. We set objectives for strategy based on value to be realized. And in order to re realize them, the portfolio starts to select the investment based on the benefits. And then the program starts to transform the operation to realize these benefits after they uh, uh, finish. And the projects under the programs provide the capabilities and enablers, the deliver deliverables that the programs will use with the operation to realize the benefit. And operations are the people who realize the sustainable benefit. It's a chain and you cannot break the chain. There is no one single hero. If these five do not work together, we will not achieve the value we are looking for, and hence we will not realize our vision. So, all these to actually, of course you plan them, but once you execute, it is up to operation to realize the benefit and achieve the value. This is why I started my life as a project manager, and in some of the cultures or learning we had, it was like a silo. Projects are not operation, as if we were enemies. When we matured, we understood that the ultimate objective of any project is to serve operations. So, of course, there are many frameworks. This is the British framework for managing benefits, which has lots of pillars aligning with strategy, integrating with performance management, and so on. And uh, this is the, the, the PMI uh, cycle for uh, implementing managing benefit. I will, I will share these slides with you later on. And the last point I like to speak about is portfolio management, which is not a group of projects. A group of projects is a group of projects. It can be managed by a PMO. A portfolio is there to realize the strategy, to provide the value. So it is permanent, whereas projects are temporary. It's there to stay with you. And in the life cycle of portfolio, you do have initiation and you plan and you execute, and then you don't close. In project, you close. In program, you close. In portfolio, you optimize, and you optimize, and then you optimize again. This is what you do in portfolio management. And under portfolio, there are many processes, but you know what is the most important process in a portfolio? Uh, strangely enough, it is to kill a project or program in optimization. Doing the hard decision, when the official comes and says, listen, we are investing here, but there are no benefits, or there are better alternatives, let's kill it, and spare the remaining resources to something else, and very few are courage enough to make such a decision. And if we do not do it, we are losing the portfolio for something that will not get us any value at all. This is why portfolio is so strategic and so important. Of course, it, it links to multiple uh, uh, other um, uh, project and program and agile processes and whatnot. Within portfolio, we don't only manage the delivery, we manage the supply. We manage the supply and demand. And one objective of optimizing resources, which is similar to what Matthew said in the morning, this is the used capacity, uh, this is what we have, okay, and the allocated is very little. So we, have, we are paying to a lot, lot of salaries to people who do not provide results or value, and there are lots of opportunities outside. In portfolio management, we do this capacity planning. We try to upskill our resources so that we have more allocated resources and less sitting on the bench. And we do this one year over the other, after the other, until we have most of our resources allocated. And this is when you achieve a status, if you heard about it, we can do more with less. Only after doing the hard work, okay? Excellence, the Ajama, is not something you buy, it's a status you achieve after working for years and years in a smart 
and half man. So, in this conference, we spoke about multiple platforms, of course, or frameworks. Each one of these requires at least a full session, at least a master class, at least a full course, and many of them have even accredited certifications. We're going to be presenting these to the Egyptian government and private sector, inshallah, in the coming period. Uh, we, we, we spoke about the enterprise big data, we spoke about portfolio of, of BIO, a little bit about managing benefit, of course, about the strategy implementation framework, uh, Sophia, uh, digitalization. And what better to close our sessions today? We have two things more. Uh, Antonio is going to share a couple of things and, and ideas with you, then I will take uh, some questions together, me and him. And after that, uh, we will split. Those who have the Sophia work the workshop will go there, and the others will remain with Dr. Kippe and John Willem Middleburg for the big data presentation. Thank you very much. Antonio, can you join me, please? Okay, we're, thank you for this time. I know we're all uh, a bit tired after this intense two days. So we'll keep it very short and just uh, the key ideas that you can read in the book anyway. We've talked about a lot of innovation and disruptions around public sector, about education, about IT, but there's one thing we've not discussed that, that needs to be disrupted, which is project management. Okay, so. We want projects to make this strategy happen. We need to disrupt it. And this is what I want to briefly talk about. Uh, but you'll have time to read that. Quickly on the project economy. This is a concept I developed like four years ago. One thing is that at macro level, the world is seeing more projects in this decade than never before. The COVID, the pandemic, all what's going on. Uh, the governments are putting um, funds like trillions just to recover a uh, healthcare system economy. Never seen that before. So that means that the world will need more projects than ever. From a, an organizational perspective, if you look at your company, um, the focus has been for a century on operations. Operations get most of the resources, most of the people were working in operations, most of the management time was put on operations. Projects, if you were working in projects, you always felt like second class, right? What is a project? It can be delayed. Project, priorities always operations, the KPIs of operations. Luckily, we got very, very efficient on that part. That's the blue side. So what has happened over time is that people have more projects. Yeah, we, we need less resources in operations because we are more efficient. So the people are starting to have more projects. And you can feel that people have more projects today than 10 years ago. <laughs> on top of their day to day job. But the big disruption that happens is when artificial intelligence robots comes into a company like banking, for example, where they take away most of the operations. Then you don't need people in operations. Today in a bank, you, less, you have less bankers than IT people. Yeah, it's all managed by machines. So what happens is that in the project economy, about 80% to 90% of the resources are working in projects, agile team programs, strategic initiatives. They're not working anymore in boxes in an operational structure. This is very disruptive. I'm not saying that the project managers will do project management. It's everybody is going to do projects in the way you want, not talking to program projects agile, but they will say that the way of work is radically <laughs> different. And that means that the leadership whose focus on the blue side most of the time, how are we doing with our operations, needs to shift the focus into how are we doing with our implementation? How are we doing with our projects? Most of the senior leaders, CEOs, don't spend enough time in their projects. By far, they don't spend time on them. So that's a radical disruption. The future of work in your companies, public, private, is project-based. That's clear. And regardless of what you do, because operations is going to be done by machine. What does it mean? <clears throat> you will read that, but I think a couple of years. We go from strategic planning, where was the big thing in companies, what do we do in five, ten years, 
to strategic implementation. Let's have an orientation, let's have an ambition for 2025. We're going to find you focus on implementation. This is something that the project management community is not used to. Bring revenues, not just benefits, revenues. And this is, we're not used to it. The revenues are produced by the operational people, commercial teams. But we're saying now, you head of PMO, you're going to bring 50% of the revenues of your company. 50% is responsibility of the PMO now. That's the way I see PMO, the modern PMO. It's not just making sure that the projects are delivered on time and produce the goals and the levels. Revenue. If your company makes 200 million, 100 have to come from the project management office. We're not used to that. So radical change. Um, the most silly discussion I've ever seen in the world of projects is the discussion between is either Waterford or Agile. We spent 20 years fighting against each other, and that was terrible because it didn't lead to success. Today, digital transformation projects, you saw that from Robin, mostly managed as well in Agile ways, 90% failure. So what we need to do is combine them. And then I think the role of the chief operating officer, COO, was the number two in most of the companies for a century. That role is dead. We don't need COOs. If operations is shrinking, you don't need COOs. I'm writing an article now for HBR. The chief project officer should be number two. Number two, this is an executive. He's close to the chief transformation officer, but becoming a permanent role. Number two, to oversee 80% of the resources in a company. The PMO as we know them today are dead. Because PMO is a, it's a box in a hierarchy, and hierarchies is not the best way to work in an agile world. So we need to reinvent PMOs. Uh, Sadi was talking rightly about this needed change. I don't know if you're trying to do resource planning in your company. It's impossible. Forget about resource planning. Resource planning is a thing from the past. When operations was primary, when everybody had the box, in a company, you could plan resources. You could say where well, I'm going to be working in three months because we all work in the same place, right? Today, mixing a bit of operations with much projects, it's impossible to resource planning, impossible. So forget about that. Job descriptions, I don't know who has a job description where it says this is what you need to do for the next three years. That's dead, dead. Also, we don't need job descriptions. How can you know what you're going to do in three years? IBM has 100,000 job descriptions, they decided to cancel them. People have jobs, but they have jobs as a role in a project. We're going to be all a bit of consultants. They tell me, Antonio, what is this different with the gig economy? <clears throat> you know gig economy, a lot of freelancers working with the company, project is over, they move to another company. The difference with the project economy is that the gig economy is in your company. Okay, so most of your employees become freelancers. They belong to your company, but they're going to flow with the priorities of the company. It's radical. HR, I met the future, you need to drive big change. It's very difficult. Imagine tomorrow you say your company, we're canceling all the job descriptions. Panic, but that's the future. And I talk about the skills very briefly. Quickly, <clears throat> a couple of other concepts. One of the things that upsets me most, and I was chairman of PMI, is this, the failure rate. It was mentioned yesterday. That's why I think we need to disrupt project management. It, it is not possible to continue with a 70% failure rate. There's no other profession in the world that has the biggest failure rate in the world, which is project management. That's crazy. How can we keep saying we are reliable, we're trusted, we're the future, and then, well, everything is going to fail, right? It's impossible. So something had to change. And, um, and what I'm going to tell you is that 80% of the task today of a project manager, program manager, PMO, will disappear. Only 20% will stay. So there's 80% of things that we need to do different. Okay, and I don't want to leave you upset of the conference. I'm going to give you positive thoughts, but I think we need to start with us if we want to make it happen in this great period. Simplification, three quick things, the canvas. Every simple method around management, like strategy, five, Michael Porter, five forces, like marketing, seven Ps, 
from Kotlin are simple. In project management, we have nothing simple. Nothing is simple in project management. Agile was super simple. Yeah, 12 principles, but that's what makes it very successful. In project management, we wanted to control everything, and we wanted to have a change control for every big change, small change, medium change. So we created a big machine. I'm not saying it's bad, but most of the people don't care. Okay, so you have the time to read about the project canvas, which in 10 minutes you understand the fundamentals of project management. 10 minutes, 15, you can analyze any project in your company. And you can have people who are not professional project management in the discussion. Say, what are we missing in this project? Is the stakeholder, is the sponsor, is the governance? That's what you need to know. I don't care if you have a project charter or not. And if you have 20 pages or 50 pages, who cares? Let's talk about the important things here. The story of Agile versus um, Waterfall, wrong, very wrong, 20 years discussion. I think we need to build the tool set. In your companies, all of your companies, in the ministries, we need Agile. We need a project, program, portfolio. We need Agile, um, Scrum. We need lean, lean startup if we're setting up a new business. We need continuous improvement because many of the projects today should not be projects, should be continuous improvement. So we need that all in your people. There's a lot to train because project management needs to learn this. People who are not doing projects, they need to learn this too. This is the future, plus lots of soft skills. And then one thing that I get a bit, always a bit pushback because I talk to many project management communities throughout the implementation is the way we measure project management. I'm sure if you don't project management, they will tell you this triple constraint is the most important thing ever in project management. The scope or what cost and time. But then analyzing thousands of projects, I realize there's something wrong. Imagine I tell you, we have a project which is going to take four years and it's going to cost seven million. It took more than four years, 14 years, and it cost a little bit more than seven million, 102. What would project management say? What a disaster, huh? What a terrible project. We should have stopped that project, right? I'm talking about the Sydney Opera House. How can you say that that was a bad project? How can you say to senior leaders that according to project management is a terrible project when in one year they deliver more benefits than the 100 million that they went? So something is missing in this profession where we cannot measure, we cannot talk about what really matters. Of course, the three different constraints are important, but we need other things. So I love you, you'll see this later on, but. So we have that, we need that, but I think we need to focus on what Sadi was talking about the benefits. This is the most important thing, right? There can be a project which collects as long as the benefits are delivered. And then the other part is uh, the people. Where do we know if the people are engaged? The projects which are most successful are when your team is engaged. How do you measure that? Where is that in the project management methodology? Nowhere. So I think we need to have that engagement which starts with the purpose and with the people, what they want to do. Um, I always say to senior leaders, I do a lot of uh, small workshops with senior leaders, and they say, Antonio, I tell them, you know what's the most engaged people in, your, in a project? They say, well, no, I don't know, volunteers. So when you're going to launch a project, CEO, ask who wants to volunteer. And that will say that that people see something beneficial for them. It's sustainability, it's they want to grow, they want to work with that person. Uh, and you say, how many times you do that? They say, never. We always appoint people working in front. And then I just them, if you ask who wants to volunteer, and nobody raised their hand, nobody says, I want to volunteer for this project, what does it tell you? That project should never done. You don't need a business case, you don't need three months analyze. If nobody wants to volunteer in your project, don't do them. Don't do them. They're going to fail, 100%. Okay, so quick quick tips that work a lot. This is what I think is great about Agile we need to embrace. This is a hospital in Brussels. They started in building 2016, finished by 2020, four years, which for Brussels, Belgium is quite fast. They're not the most fast people in projects. To my surprise, 2018, two years before the deadline, they opened the hospital. So they were, a part of it was 
operating people, delivering babies. And the other part, the higher floors, they were still making noise and construction. And I thought, wow, this is something disruptive. This is something that we should be doing, not just with apps or so forth, but with many kinds of projects. How can we deliver the benefits faster? That should be the first and the only question that the project manager should be thinking about. What are the benefits and how can we deliver them faster? That's the most important thing, okay? Of course, the rest makes sense. The rest we need to know, but what the stakeholders need to know is this. Another trick that I give in my book is benefits is one of the uh, signs or additions to project management which has not picked up. Benefit management has been there for 20 years, but people not know how to use it. And my proposal is instead of you trying to define the benefits for your project with the finance people and ask your stakeholders, ask your, st you're launching a new application for HR, ask HR what do they expect from this application, ask your employees what do they expect, ask the unions if you have, ask your key stakeholders, what do you expect from this project? Don't wait till the end. Ask them, let them make your benefits. I make a list with the benefits that they give me. What if I ask all my stakeholders and they say, I don't see any benefits from this project. Don't do the project. You don't need three months to lead. If nobody sees benefits in your project, don't do that. So I think for benefit management, the key is not internal, it's external, asking. Okay, this is the disruption part. We don't see that in benefit management. It should be the essential part in benefit And here's where I come to the end. I think this is the traditional project life cycle in a project. Uh, if you look at PMI or PIMPRINCE2, PIM we don't know what happens in R&D innovation. We don't know, we don't care. It's not part of our scope. We do the white part. We talk a little bit about benefits. A little bit because we know it's important, but we don't know how to manage them. Uh, and we focus on the why. The disruption happens here. 80% is gone. Okay? We need to understand ideation. We need to play a role in innovation. We need to facilitate all the ideas. Make sure that some of them go through the line. Which some of them will be projects, some of them will be prototypes, some of them will, will use agile. But we should be the referee. We should be the person to say, this idea, it's terrible, don't start it. Most of the projects fail because they were too mature. The iPhone took three years in ideation. They didn't jump straight on the idea. I believe 80% of the work that we're doing today in projects will be automated, will be using AI. I'm investing in a few startups on selection, on planning, because there's very few professions that they still manage their projects with a software which is 40 years old. MS Project, Excel, PowerPoint. How can you manage billions of money in an Excel? It's crazy, no? We've managed technology for operations, but we've not invested in technology for projects. So I think that's where the biggest potential. And when project managers tell me, 80% of my work disappeared, what should I do? Well, it opens the opportunities to you to focus on benefits, to focus on ideation, on people's skills, leadership skills, so don't be afraid, projects, there's enough, but we need to change. So the focus for me, for a project manager, and I have a few around me, is benefits. That's it, and it's not financial, it can be social, it can be climate. That's 40% of what you should be doing, two days per week. Okay, so that's a big radical. I don't want to see, I tell to my project manager, I don't want to say your project plans with milestones, and I want to see just the plan with the benefits. Tell me, if you're in the hospital, when you're going to start opening the hospital, how many patients we're going to save. That's what I care. Yeah, you have your plan, you need that, but your stakeholders don't need that. Your sponsor doesn't need that. Okay, so radical. And the last part, I say sometimes, and I will finish with the story of a good friend who was number four in Microsoft. We play together. <laughs> when we were kids in Spain. He's from Atletico Madrid, I'm from Real Madrid, so we were fighting all the time. But anyway, um, I lost track, I moved for countries, I met him in a conference in Singapore five years ago, and he was speaking, I was speaking, and he, and we just, hi, how are you doing, huh? And we met, we had dinner, 
And I asked him, how do you reach vice president of Microsoft? He was working with Bill Gates. And, and he said, listen, I started my career as a salesperson. Um, at one point, Microsoft wanted to enter a new market. They went into ERP, you know, SAP, Oracle. Microsoft didn't have that. They bought a company called Navision from Scandinavia. And they said to my friend, Tessa, do you want to manage this project? And he said, yes, fine, I don't know anything about project management, but it sounds interesting. So he took the project, he was the program director. He asked me, so he, he did the PMP, and he did just 100% uh, this project integration, creating the new ERP division. And it was a big success, he finished in two years and a half instead of three. So I told him, I asked him, yes, sir, great, you understand what I'm doing now. Um, what did you do, which project did you do afterwards? Right? Because that's what we do. And he said, Antonio, I didn't ask for another project. And I said, what? I got angry. You're, you're not good because every time we finish a project in project management, we do the next one. Right? And if you did it right, you get the higher project. And he said, no, Antonio, I didn't ask for another project. I talked to my bosses, including Bill Gates, that I want to run the business unit that I created. There's nobody else in Microsoft that knows more about the division than me. I spent two years and a half, day and night. Why should I give it to somebody else? Why do we need to work in boxes? Why do we need to have these silos? No, let me run what I did, mean, and I deliver the benefits. And that was a big, big, big disruption for me. I understand if you work in the public sector that you will hand over. But within your company, sometimes the people who run your projects are the persons who know most. Give them the chance to run it, to sell it, to develop, and you'll see huge improvements. So, don't want to scare you. I think the future is bright, but project management, change managers, uh, agile strategy need to change and need to do that quickly. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And uh, I think there will be a is not affected, and CEO is mainly focused on the operation. And PMO, like I said, it is something parallel. If it works or it will not work, you will see. And the other issue you talk about, which I think is very important for volunteers. Volunteers are very important, but the problem is if the leaders are not education enough and they do not understand this new concept, they will not then let a good person from operation work on the projects. Because still the culture is that project is something we still will see. We don't, they don't have the real belief and the buy-in, because sometimes projects are imposed by the board of directors and etc. So the question is how to make the balance between the volunteers, because some people could volunteer, 
because they don't fit in the operation, because they don't feel they are appreciated in the operation, so they will try our machine. And on the other hand, how can we make sure the good and skilled people are on the project? Because this is the future. The operation is the ongoing business, but right? the future is on the project. So it is the reverse. We need to put the good people for the project because they will have, they will make sure of the community. We give an excellent example about the Microsoft guy. He managed the project and he took in charge the business unit. Uh, most of the projects is you do the project and you give it to other person and you, because you don't know what he's going to get. Okay, so if you can give some advice on this, thank you. Thank you. I'll answer the first one, maybe so that you have something to add. But I think you are the most important problem is that is the senior leadership, the CEO understanding that um, it's important to change the habits. Uh, I agree that not everybody can volunteer in a project. It's a bit extreme, so I just want to shake a bit your thinking, but I agree that you need try to balance the project, but volunteering is just a, a sign that there's something for people that they will fight for, that they like it. Um, but definitely one of the biggest challenges is, is changing the senior leaders, the CEO uh, mindset, that they see this, like you say, your projects are their future. How much time are you, senior leader, putting in your future? And you will be surprised that they don't put too much. I was interviewed by Harvard Business Review in a podcast, and I said one of the biggest changes that we need to see is CEOs spending more time in the future, which is your most in project projects. And, and she told me, the lady, listen, a few weeks ago, I interviewed the CEO of Pfizer, and he was developing the COVID vaccine. And Albert said that, listen, um, in that project to develop the COVID vaccine, I spent 100% of my time. I was there day and night. I was. I choose the best people to work on the COVID vaccine. And usually, I never spend time in projects. And I said that's the difference. You know, if you have the senior leaders, and I always say at least one day per week, they need to be focusing on the most important projects. Being there, not just the steering committee once per month, but being there. I think that's where you see the big change. That's where you see. Another big uh, challenge that I see is, I said that yesterday, companies have today more projects than people. If they know how many projects, most companies don't know how many projects. Talking to a big company, Cosmetics, you all know, the CTO, Chief Transformation Officer, he said, we have 1,500 strategic projects. I said, what? 1,000? And we don't know how many other projects. So that's a big problem. And it's hard to come down. So an advice that I give to CEOs is, just choose three projects, the most important, and extract them, like you were saying. Extract them. Make a full-time, dedicated team as much as you can. When you're small, that project will prepare. That project will, will be most likely a success because you bring them out from the day-to-day -day business, the culture, the KPIs, take them out, put them in another room, in another office, just for the next year. And do that for the top three. Those three projects are going to prepare. So start small and then you change the culture. Great question, thank you. You got to the essence, and that's what we need to work a lot. Convincing senior leaders that projects are their future. How much time do they dedicate? They have to increase that. You want to add? Great.
managing butterfly to respond to our operations when you identify how do you identify the benefits? Who is going to realize the benefit? There is a term called a benefit owner. Okay? So the benefit owner is usually somebody at the operation side because these people would stay after the project managers deliver and on the way. So if we start before doing the job, when doing the business case in the very early in the aggregation, bringing these people in the room and telling them, this is, these are the benefits we want to realize. They say, no, it does not work like this. How does it work? So they are engaged from, from day one. How many times some of you participated in IT projects and once you went to delivery, the, the, the user tells you, it, it does not work like this. Or we did not ask for something like this. Okay, why? Because they were not engaged before you start. So the key here is to consider them as the benefit. These are the, the benefit owners. Very important, identify them as key stakeholders, uh, get their requirements first, get them engaged from the business case until the operation. Through the whole life cycle, then they consider the project their own, their baby. And they will give you very good and valuable feedback across all the phases of the project. Why? Because they, you have their buy-in up front, and they are waiting for this new car or new facility or, or new new uh, equipment or new software to upskill or upgrade uh, or achieve more operational excellence. This is the only way to have it. But to exclude them, do something, then come tell them, listen. What you've been doing was wrong, you have to do it this way. They get you out. They will not listen to you. Okay. This is, it's simple, stakeholder management. Yeah. One, just one point which I'm asking every time I meet the HR is, how can you incentivize people working in projects? So most of the incentive, 99%, would be on operational. So I think HR has to say, okay, for those three projects, we're going to incentivize. There's a bonus, and you're going to get benefit. People want to be recognized and get some financial compensation. So I think also the HR component, the, the rewards, and it has to shift. We're talking about a very different world where there's no need for job description. So let's give these three people, three projects, a special bonus so the project gets achieved. So that, I think, we are not there yet, but that will help with what Sadi is saying. So, okay, if I get the benefit, if I'm going to work in a strategy project, yeah, of course, it's, it's interesting. But don't expect to do that without any kind of rewards. This is um, not making sense anymore. Great question. Thank you. Okay. So we'll start now with the last uh, seminar with Dr. Kibbe uh, on uh, enterprise big data. And uh, with respect to Sophia, uh, we are okay. And all of those who, want, who wish to attend the Sophia Masterclass or just uh, please be outside the registration desk with the platform. Thank you. Very much based on the nature of the data that you are collecting. I'll give you a very simple example. The type of data, the type of data you collect when you are collecting big data is the type that statistical methods do not work on, for many reasons. Least of which, the fact that uh, most of statistical, uh, uh, most of statistical techniques rely, classical statistical techniques that is, rely on uh, not causality, but on uh, what they call it, uh, correlation. Correlation, not causality. This is the problem. Here, we are actually talking about causality. We are looking for causality because this is where the real money is. So, in order to be able to do that, we are going to go through some special techniques related to big data in order to be able to read the benefits. Otherwise, big data is going to pass us and we are not going to make any benefit from it. So, in order to do that, the most important part of this discussion or this framework to actually start, if you have a correct strategy, if you find enough time to spend on it, and enough effort to invest in it, then by all means you will have what you will have a successful implementation. This strategy first starts with defining your business objectives. By business objectives, I mean those business objectives that are related to 
digitization or a digital technology or a digital way of life, if you want. We've had many examples uh, throughout the day, but these business objectives, they really need to be defined. And how do you define them? You define them based on your own values. So coming out of your own values, obviously you are incorporating some people-based values. Some people-based values, and these, these people-based values, they require you to listen to the voice, you know, the vox populi, this, the voice of the population. The problem is that the population is big, big data, so you have to listen to the voice of big data. Once you have decided on that, you have your uh, new value now, so you have your objective and you bridge them together with the strategy. And bridge is by all means uh, filling a gap. So which means that we at, uh, in one place here when we're building this strategy, we're trying to fill a gap. So what is this gap? A gap takes two points and there is a gap between them and you need to fill it. So you start with the first point, which is the second one. Execute a current state assessment. Where am I now? That's to say, in light of this objective that I have, this objective, this new objective I have, where am I now? Where do I stand? I stand here. Okay, next. I identify and prioritize use cases. Use cases are like the cantilevers of a bridge. Use cases, if anybody of you is actually familiar with uh, project management, they are exactly like business cases in project management. What, uh, what good are they? They are actually the seed of any given project. They are the way for us to execute a certain vision, a certain strategy. So this means that from the current status where we are at, we try to move on by building use cases. The problem with use cases is that there are many of them, and which means and they are not created equally. So what you need to do is what you need to prioritize them. You give the priorities according to, for example, impact and feasibility. So if you decide on impact and feasibility, then by all means you will be able to draw a two-dimensional semantic map and say, okay. This is the priority of this. This is what a project management is called portfolio management. So you are managing a portfolio of use cases. Like, next, what do we do? We see where these use cases are actually getting us to. We formulate a big data roadmap. So it means that I am here. This is the second step. I, have, I am using some business uh, or some use cases that get me somewhere here along the roadmap. The roadmap means I execute this uh, project first, or this use case first, and this use, uh, the other use case second, and so on and so forth. I wake up and I find that I am actually, I find myself here, but the problem is I want to get there. So this is my what? This is my new gap. What do I do? This is my new current state, and I build some use cases, and I go over and over again. This is called what? This is called embedding through change management. I'm doing change in iterations. So this is how the strategy is drawn and executed at the same time. The second tenant of the big data framework is the infrastructure, or what we call the architecture. When we, took, when we take a look at the architecture, we realize two things. First of all, this is the NIST architecture. This is the architecture which is undertaken by NIST. You understand that, and this is something that uh, the Ministry of Communication talked a lot about this morning, which is the matter of infrastructure. They emphasize the fact that if you don't have infrastructure, you have nothing. Well, in fact, what you have is strategy, but it is strategy without teeth. So in order to give your strategy some teeth, some ground, you need to have what? You need to have an infrastructure, what that you call architecture. And this architecture, it has five players at hand. It has five players. Basically, the first player is you, the data consumer. The one who is actually reaping the benefits out of uh, big data uh, applications. So we see that. On the other hand, the second player, you can see the data consumer to the, left, to the right. On the left, you have the data provider. The data or the big data provider is the one who is actually collecting the data. It could be the government. It could be some, uh, for example, Google. Google has lots and lots of big data, and it is ready for, for sales. But the thing is that we don't actually do any Indian uh, trade. There is no barter in this case. 
there has to be at least three layers between these two. There is no direct uh, purchase. So these three, first we have the big data application provider and the big data framework provider. What do we mean by the, let's start with the framework provider. This is closer to uh, infrastructure. The big data framework provider is the one that provides the, in, the actual infrastructure that is required to do two things. To store the data and to uh, process the data. So storing and processing. Uh, you might say it like, uh, uh, what we can do is we can buy the data, put it on our servers, and then work on it. Unfortunately, uh, this depends on the size of the client. You hear sometimes, okay, we are going on the cloud. And sometimes you hear the, uh, the, the, uh, the point word, a private cloud. Well, I have a private cloud in my, in my house and it is sized at about uh, 70 terabytes. But does it mean that big data is actually uh, it's squeezed into 70 terabytes? The fact of the matter is that you need somebody to procure for you an infrastructure which is distributed, an infrastructure of storing the data in what we call storage nodes. And the processing is taking place in processing nodes. Like, in this case, what is the role of the uh, framework provider? The role of the framework provider is to be able to uh, administer the traffic between these uh, processing nodes and these storage nodes. Let's say, for example, you need to uh, do some kind of analytics on big data, right? So what you do is you invoke, di uh, indirectly, of course, you invoke the uh, big data framework provider. That provider, for example, if you want to use something which is vendor free, you use uh, Hadoop, the Hadoop framework, which uses a technology called MapReduce in order to take your order of analytics and what kind of uh, big data you want here, we are not talking about sample data anymore, we are talking, talking about loads and loads of big data that is dynamic, it is renewed all the time. Then this request goes, and there are those nodes that are designated to be what? The collection nodes. The data is stored on these nodes. And then some other nodes are invoked in order to procure processing power, not storage power. Not storage capacity, but processing power. And this is called distributed compute. This is all about distributed compute. Distributed computing is basically distributed storage and distributed processing. Once you have done that, your framework is actually working, and you get your, resor your results collected back. All of that is done on the cloud. Nobody knows exactly where it took place, but you have your results at the end of the day, even if you don't own a computer, which actually brings us to the uh, fourth player. The fourth player here is the big data application provider. The big data application provider is the fourth party, if you want, that actually produces for you the application by which you are going to interface with the framework in order to be able to process your data. That could be, for example, a, uh, a, a for example, an application that, for example, forecasts the weather for you. It gives you a specialized uh, weather forecast, for example. And finally, you have the system orchestrator. System orchestrators actually work on a higher level in administering this type of distribution. I'll give you an example. You cannot access big data unless you have uh, some kind of allowance. Some, some of this big data is actually related to uh, actual people. So in order to make sure that this data is being treated ethically and not being mined for for breaches of privacy, you need to have a regulator that we call system orchestrator to make sure that whatever you do with this data is actually legal. This is one side of this work. And this is the whole architecture. This is the infrastructure of big data. Then, thirdly, we come to the actual engine of solution. In this case, I'm talking about what? I'm talking about the big data algorithms. Big data algorithms are the, if you want, the uh, mathematical, actually, to be specific, it is the, uh, the uh, probabilistic or uh, uh, the uh, statistical engine behind big data. Because to begin with, if you want to meet your data, your data is stochastic. It is uh, data which is uh, random. It's random data. 
What you are trying to do is you are trying to find some order within that data in order to find insights. Insights that you cannot find otherwise by any classical method of uh, analysis. For example, you have, uh, in terms of the objectives, you have like six objectives related. I'm not going to, to go into details. Yeah? Six objectives related to the algorithm. That's to say the level of depth of any given algorithm. The most shallow one is describing big data. You want to describe big data. Description, for example, average standard deviation, uh, some, uh, uh, some distributions, and so on. But if you want to go further, you go into, into, uh, into relation. You make inference from your data. Inference, for those of you who, are still, who still remember statistics, uh, or I guess some of you are actually uh, working within this uh, field of statistics, we're talking either about uh, uh, point estimation, which is confidence interval estimation, or we are talking about hypothesis testing. Either way, this is actually in the service of any given industry. There are so many industries that actually depend on these things to pass judgment, or if you want, generalization over data that is actually chaotic by usage of a sample. By, because big data at the end of the day is also a sample because tomorrow it's going to change. It's going to be somewhere else. So we don't want to be able to follow that. Then it goes on from <coughs> descriptive to inferential. Then it goes to regression. It goes to uh, describing the relationship. Then it goes further to predicting. And instead of interpolating, you start extrapolating. Then after predictive, you go into prescriptive, which is all about optimization. You have a model, you have uh, a forecast of uh, the parameters. Now all you need to do is what? You need to uh, set up a prescriptive, that's to say a prescriptive model, a model that will let you optimize on the type of uh, results that you get. For example, how do I best use my resources, my human resources, my uh, natural resources? What is the best benefit I can reap out of them? So this is the highest form. They call it also the uh, mechanistic, mechanistic uh, analysis. So, um, and these are some uh, examples, all right? This is uh, an example on uh, clustering or cluster analysis. What is cluster analysis? Cluster analysis is the capability of collecting uh, entities together by a common denominator. An example of that would be the rule-based rule-based collection or clustering of uh, people serving as or acting as clients in the banking sector. In the banking sector, you have people with transactions. So these people are identified by certain, uh, if you want, by certain characteristics. Like when you identify them uh, by certain characteristics, you would want, you would want to uh, be able to offer them services that they, they would be really interested in. So you follow up on their, uh, on their uh, transactions and you see what they like and you come up with specialized uh, formulations for what they need actually. So this is called a recommender system. You have seen this recommender system before where in Amazon, every time you go to buy something or even to window shop, they follow you up with uh, you know, uh, swarms of, uh, you know, of uh, promotions and stuff like that. So this is the algorithmic approach. Now we come to processes. By processes, what do we mean? We mean how to integrate, how to integrate big data uh, framework uh, capacities into an organization. Because you, I guess you, uh, you know, for example, how we integrate a project within a, uh, a company or within an organization. There are many ways to do that. Uh, Antonio was speaking about dedicating a PMO or, or uh, dedicating a functional unit for it, which is the PMO. But sometimes this is not something that we can actually have control of. It could be operational, yeah? it could be residing in a functional department, like the operations department, or for example, in the marketing department, it depends. So in this case, how do we actually initiate this big data within that unit, within this functional unit? And the imperative here, the, the, the key word here is how to initiate, because you call this an initiative. We call big data initiative in place of the uh, vanilla uh, flavor of 
a project. And instead of talking about a general project, we talk about specific project related to big data, and we call it an initiative, a big data initiative. Right. This big data initiative, we have to take care of covering it by three types of processes. By types, I mean that there is a group of processes within these. The first group is related to the data analytic processes that we've just discussed in algorithms. So this is secured on the side. <clears throat> on the other hand, we have to take care about data good governance processes and data management processes. Data governance and data management are two different things because in governance, what we are actually looking at, what we are actually looking at is not the quality of data, but the uh, legality of the data. So, uh, data governance is about the legality of the data, and the data management processes are about the quality of the data. What do I mean by that? First of all, you have to make sure that your processes by which you are analyzing the data, as I said before, are actually legal. They are not actually meant to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, deceive anybody. Because sometimes researchers, what they do is they conduct research in order to deceive the people that are actually subjects to the research. So they are not actually benefiting them by the end of the day, and this is not ethical. This is on one hand. On the other hand, you have also the matter of privacy. You heard the one question about the matters of privacy or no. How do we guarantee that our privacy is actually preserved? Well, there are many ways to do that. They told you that they use applications that allow you to keep your privacy. This, these applications are called double-blind uh, applications. Double-blind in what? Double-blind in the matter that the, uh, the, the consumers of big data services do not see each other, and the ones that are serving them do not see them. So this is called a double-blind. This is how do, you, how do you get to do that by the processes that are actually concerned with governance. Then finally, you have the processes that have to do with the data management in the sense of quality. That's to say, you are offering a service that is scientifically sound. This is analytic processes. You are uh, providing service which is ethical and legal. This is governance and management. Data management processes means that the quality of the service is actually guaranteed, meaning that the results that you are getting are guaranteed to be, uh, you know, uh, are guaranteed to be a way to improve the quality of your life. Because by the end of the day, this is big data. Big data, opposite to uh, small data, doesn't require any uh, statistical significance. It carries its own significance with it. And if you remember the uh, alpha, <coughs> the level of significance, or the type 1 error, it doesn't exist in big data. This is not like classical uh, statistics. Then, the fifth is the big data functions. In this case, we are talking about mainly five functions. And by functions, what I mean, I mean the human resources that are required to cover uh, your initiative, your big data initiative. Let's say, for example, you want to go through a big data initiative. The first thing you have to think about is what, uh, who is going to be able to translate the strategy into actual work. In this case, you are looking for big data professionals. So you have one certification called big data professional. It's an entry level certification. And the way it is done, this function is done through a big data center of excellence. The big data center of excellence is the equivalent of the BMO in project management. So what you have is the team first, you have the analyst, the scientist, the engineer. We are talk I'm going to talk a little bit in some detail about uh, these five roles. I'm not going to talk about them here, but uh, a bit later. Then you have the big data lab, in which you are actually building a working environment. A very simple example, you procure, for example, some accounts, RStudio accounts. Are, they are languages for free. And the RStudio uh, services are for free to up to a certain extent. To up to, to a certain extent, you have actually covered your team with a work environment in which they are free to do whatever they want. Then, you have a proof of concept. In this case, the use cases that we talked about, you apply them in this lab, and then you get your proof of concept. A proof saying that, well, we are actually getting results out of this initiative. Next, what do you do? 
you uh, use the agile met methodology, which is fail quickly and learn from it and do iterations one and two and so on and so on and so forth. And every time you are getting better at what you are doing. Once you have achieved that, you make a charging model. A charging model means that you make a uh, cost centered model. You understand what I mean by cost centered model? In this case, we are talking about a uh, function that's actually carrying its own cost. Well, and finally, you have the underlying spirit of big data, which is related to uh, AI or artificial intelligence. In this case, we're talking about basically the theory, if you want, of incorporating human cognition inside machines. They used to call it reinforcement learning. Now they call it, in general, machine learning. This is one of the applications of AI. Thank you. Now, what does the enterprise big data framework do? They are a, an ecosystem, an ecosystem composed of these, uh, this framework and the components of this framework. And they provide five different, uh, if you want, uh, best practices based uh, references. Starting with the big data professional, and then you go from there. This is an entry level certification, and then you go from there to two directions the IT direction or the infrastructure direction, and the algorithmic direction. In the IT or the infrastructure direction, you have two certifications the architect and the engineer. What is the difference? Both of them are related to infrastructure. But the engineer is actually responsible for cleaning the data. Why, why is that so important? Big data requires 80% of the workload in order just to clean the data. So cleaning the data takes 80% of the time. So you can imagine how many people are working there in this department. This is the largest department of big data. Then you have the architect who actually decides on how to apply the NIST framework that I just explained in the second uh, step. On the other hand, on the algorithmic side, we have two roles. The role of the analyst and the role of the scientist, the big data scientist. So what's the difference? The analyst is not a senior, could be a junior. Using prepackaged uh, models or prepackaged algorithms in order to solve uh, problems. And this guy is uh, responsible for taking the problem, applying a prepackaged algorithm, all right, and then uh, conducting the results to uh, upper management. But on the other hand, if we need to actually uh, work on the cost and the quality of the algorithm themselves, we have to resort to the data scientist. And if the data scientist is responsible for choosing which algorithm to apply. Now, the life cycle of big data, it starts with the framework and then the certification that I talked about, and then it goes to conducting these thoughts to leaders of industry in order to convince them to actually play along. And then knowledge centers are applied and conferences and events are made like this event in order to propagate this model. Because once something is actually running and working, people would actually like to be part of it. And this is what we are looking for. So this is the certification uh, roadmap I told you about. The common thing, the common certification is uh, big data professional. And then you have two wings, the wing of the algorithms, starting with the uh, analyst, then going further into the data scientist, and then the wing of the infrastructure, starting with the engineer, and then going further with the uh, architect. So, uh, this is something that we have already seen before. As you can see here, this is the type of, uh, uh, the type of uh, processes and uh, algorithms that we discussed before. If you remember, yeah. This one. But it is just three exercises. So I explained it over there, so I don't need to uh, go over it anymore. And the next step, what you can do is you can access this website. Okay? Just look for Enterprise Big Data Framework and download the free guides. Those certifications that are actually on display, their their guides are for free. Download them and look them up. Then, if you want, you can take the examinations, okay? And there are many podcasts that are made by professionals that will show you use cases in different industries, like the aviation industry, like the healthcare industry. Then, 
you can sign up for a, uh, there is a conference in May, a uh, web-based uh, or a, a Zoom-based conference in May that talks about benefits of big data. And that's it. You have any questions? I'm ready to answer. Okay. So, if you are okay, I am okay.